We are now live and on Facebook as we speak. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, all one or two of you <laughs> uh, who've joined us so far. It's wonderful to be with you uh, right now. We're just going to leave the, the stream up here for a little bit, give people a chance to uh, hop on and join us on this, uh, well, at least out by us, a cloudy, um, I was going to say Thursday afternoon, but it's definitely Monday. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the days of the week are blurring. All right, we're, uh, we're getting some folks here. Excellent. Thanks for uh, tuning in on, uh, on this cloudy Monday afternoon. Um, it's great to be with you all today. For those of you that uh, don't know who I am, my name is John Lustria. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And if you've tuned in with us today, you're in for a real treat. Um, should be a good time. Um, Thanks for uh, being prompt, punctual, hopping on uh, right on time. We appreciate it. Um, let us know in the comments where you're watching from and if you're going to get any rain today. Because uh, I think uh, out here in, uh, in Maryland, I think we're scheduled to get some rain uh, this afternoon and evening. Um, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is John Lustria. Uh, I am thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Bob Slauson. Uh, longtime docent at the at the museum, uh, he's presented on a, a myriad of topics uh, at the museum throughout the years. And today he's going to be talking about the Veteran Reserve Corps, uh, and we're going to get to that in uh, the near future. Here, uh, just want to say to everyone again, thank you for tuning in, um, not just to this video, but to all of the videos that we've been doing. We really appreciate it. Uh, and if you've enjoyed the videos, and if you anticipate enjoying this video today, uh, please maybe give us a like uh, on the video and maybe share the video to your friends. Let, let other people uh, see it and join us if they're interested. They can either watch it live or they can watch it after the fact. Uh, in case any of you are wondering, these videos do live on our Facebook page and YouTube channel long after the fact. So maybe if you have to leave early today or you joined late or something, uh, you can go back and watch this later. They will be up there for, um, for quite some time. Um, so you give us a like, share the video, uh, show it to your friends, send it to someone you think would enjoy it. Uh, and if you really enjoyed it, uh, maybe consider becoming a member uh, of the museum. Your contributions, your membership dollars uh, go directly to supporting videos like this. So if you've enjoyed all of these, um, becoming a member is the best way to show your support and to demonstrate you want us to keep making these videos. Um, so please consider becoming a member if you haven't. Um, there's no better time than today, right now, or immediately after the video, whichever works best for you. So with all that said, uh, it's wonderful to be with you here on this, uh, this Thursday afternoon. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, throw them in the comments below. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on the comments section. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, uh, Dr. Slauson and I will go through uh, some of the comments if there are any questions and, and tackle those. So with all that said, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, uh, Bob. Take us away. Um, gonna load up. Uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation we got here. Uh, do some screen sharing, and uh, we'll we'll get started here. All right. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the Veterans Reserve Corps. This is a subject that most people aren't very familiar with. Uh, and, and but and Bob, uh, I'll, I'll interject real quick here. Uh, the you need to uh, start the slideshow. Um, for I know we we set it up beforehand, but for whatever reason, it's not coming through on, the, on my screen. But the, I, I can see the slideshow. Sorry to derail you before, before you got started there. You have it now? Uh, no. No? No, but I, I saw you. You were, you were clicking the right thing. Second time's the uh, the charm, as always. Is 
So it's it's not. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to be in the uh, the slideshow presentation mode. And bear with us uh, a moment here, folks. We'll uh, be on track before you know it. Stand by, everybody. I had it working just a minute ago. I know. I, 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 I'm, I'm a witness, Bob. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah, yeah it doesn't, uh, didn't seem to. Ah, there we are. Okay. There we are. We're on track. Excellent. Okay. All right. Take us away, Bob. Okay. Once again, uh, we're going to be talking today about the Veterans Reserve Corps, which is something that most people don't really understand very much about. And in particular, uh, I think it's important because uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, Company 132 of the 2nd Battalion of the Reserve Corps, which was based in Frederick, Maryland. And as uh, in, in the beginning, as uh, is well known, the American Civil War was a bloody and a sickly war. Battle casualties were high, but casualties from disease were even higher, as most of you realize. In addition to the attrition from death, many ill and wounded were discharged as unfit for service. And the photograph here shows some of the people that are obviously unfit for active duty. Uh, I believe all of these particular people have had an amputation of a leg. Uh, in addition to the attrition from death, Many ill and wounded were discharged as unfit for active service. Many of these were trained soldiers whose military experience would have been helpful to the Army in many ways. The idea arose of creating a unit of partially incapacitated men. Uh, this wasn't really a new idea. In 1777, the Continental Congress had established an invalid corps with a uh, Colonel Louis Nicola commanding. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a photograph of Colonel Nicola, but I did find a, uh, an example of his signature, which at least uh, certifies that he existed. Um, in uh, the uh, Invalid Corps at that time, they had eight companies that were authorized, and they were to provide guard duty and uh, drill training. Recruiting began in Philadelphia in the summer of 1777, and then there were detachments created to serve at West Point and Boston, where they would man the forts and, and guard uh, the stores and the warehouses. Uh, the Corps, uh, it, the Invalid Corps, that one was disbanded in 1783 uh, to December of 84, after the end of the Revolutionary War. Obviously, there was no need for it at that time. The concept of the Invalid Corps was resurrected in 1815. Uh, in relation to the War of 1812. Uh, it was championed by the uh, newspaper, the National Intelligencer of Washington. And although there were many other supporters, the bill to create the Corps was not passed. The, uh, actually, by this time, the need uh, for uh, a war had ended, be, uh, ha and need for a Corps had ended because the war itself had actually ended. Uh, I'm don't find any information considering uh, an invalid corps in relation to the next uh, war we were involved in, that with the Mexico in the 1840s. Uh, the, as most of you uh, probably remember, there were really two branches to the uh, Mexican War. One was uh, led by Zachary Taylor down uh, from uh, Texas into northern Mexico, and the other uh, was Winfield Scott who landed at Veracruz and went across land to Mexico City. Uh, possibly uh, the issue of an invalid corps was not raised during the uh, war with Mexico because it was of short duration and uh, the number of cal casualties were relatively small. In April of 1862, the uh, War Department authorized the employment of convalescent soldiers in the hospitals to work as nurses, cooks, and hospital attendants, rather than discharging them if they could do the work. It was a place where they could uh, recuperate and uh, still be on active duty. These men replaced the healthy and fit men 
who uh, uh, initially had been detailed to work with the doctors in the hospitals, and, uh, healthy men could return to the fighting units. It also kept uh, these uh, recovering convalescent men close to the army, so they were more likely to return to duty when they were fully recovered. If they had already gone home, it was uh, unlikely that uh, they would come back. Many of them did not. Unfortunately, these men were not in organized units and there was really no feel of active duty for any of these men. And for some, this activity simply provided an excuse to avoid fighting. There were uh, men working in the hospitals who really should have returned to the line, but they kept uh, uh, pretending that they weren't quite recovered yet. So that the value to the army of these people at this point uh, was somewhat limited. In March of 1863, General Order 69 was issued stating that the wounded and feeble men in hospital who were unfit for duty, but not entirely disabled, should be organized in detachments under officers and military commanders. Uh, men from these detachments were detailed uh, for work with the provost marshal, with the hospital, and for other guards. They uh, would actually transport uh, prisoners, etc. They worked as clerks and nurses and cooks in hospitals and actually any other duties that the hospitals had. Individual detach detachments were serviceable in a limited manner, but their existence was temporary because these men were still assigned to their uh, uh, volunteer uh, companies uh, and as soon as they were judged well enough uh, to uh, do so, they were returned to their units. In fact, many of the units routinely uh, visited the hospitals uh, frequently to make sure they could get their men back. And it, actually at this time, even the hospital still continued to discharge very large numbers of people whose disability only made them unable to serve in the field. They were not totally useless to the army. In April of 1863, General Order 105 actually authorized the creation of an invalid corps. This corps would be composed of companies that would subsequently be made into battalions with stringent provisions to keep it within military limits and ensure its functionality. The source of the men uh, to serve in the corps were those men who in the field who were disabled by wounds or disease that had been contracted in the line of duty. Men who were in hospitals or camps under control of medical authorities recovering apparently, and men who had been discharged for honorable service. They could actually come back in to the uh, invalid corps uh, without uh, facing being called to line units. This applied to both officers and men. The commanders of the regiments uh, in the field were told to submit to the Provost Marshal General's office lists of men and officers who were serving in their units who were unfitted for field service. Some of these uh, were uh, on detachments, some were already in hospitals. But uh, it was important that the men had to be considered of good character regarding intelligence, industry, sobriety, and intention to duty. They didn't want a bunch of deadbeats. Partial disability was uh, not uh, questionable. They had to be established by a medical certificate after examination by a physician. Medical inspectors, surgeons in charge of hospitals, and military commanders were told to discharge no one who might be eligible for the Invalid Corps. Colonel Richard Reich of the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry was the first chief of the Bureau under the Provost Marshal General. This is a photograph of uh, Colonel Reich while he was serving uh, with uh, the cavalry unit. Every effort was made to fill the Corps as soon as possible. We have here a, uh, an example of an ad in a newspaper that is asking for men to join the Invalid Corps. And there were a lot of broadsides of various sizes and shapes that were uh, posted around as well. A recruiting station was developed uh, in each state and a camp of rendezvous was open in each state as well. The a total of 161 new companies were authorized uh, to uh, be uh, opened in this with distribution of the numbers of companies relating to the population of each state. 
as, uh, remember, we were just past the 1860 census, so that information was fairly stable. The men who uh, were uh, included in it were organized and equipped and armed at the camp of rendezvous. The initial costs were to pay, pay, be to be paid for uh, by the state, but it was to be completely reimbursed by the federal government. Enlistments in the Corps were for three years unless the patient, uh, the man was sooner discharged. Remember that these were people who were partially disabled and many of them might well uh, have increasing disability uh, with time. Uh, it's important to know that there were no bounties or premiums allowed for these men at all. On the other hand, they were paid full salary as though they were on active duty in the line. Uh, and it, to re-emphasize that there was no re-enlistment bonus for these people, even if they'd already been previously discharged. Three battalions uh, were created uh, in this system with the first battalion always having more men than both of the other two. The first battalion was composed of those who uh, were on active duty, uh, could bear a musket but, and do garrison duty, but uh, uh, weren't really fit, as we said, for uh, active duty otherwise. The second battalion were those who were more severely disabled, who had lost an arm or a hand so that they uh, uh, were only fit as hospital guards and attendants in hospitals, uh, cooks, etc. cetera. The, uh, it also included uh, men who were ill. They didn't have to be just wounded. The third battalion was to be for those who were more severely disabled uh, than these others. It's interesting that the third battalion was never activated. Men who initially had been assigned to the third battalion were reassigned to the second battalion. Uh, the, uh, in the process, the subsistence uh, was to be provided in the usual manner uh, for the, uh, the rest of the active duty military. While recruiting was in progress, a company would bear a temporary name, such as the 1st Company, 1st Battalion, organized at convalescent camp, Alexandria, Virginia. After muster and descriptive roles had reached Washington, a permanent company number was assigned, and this would be used hereafter in all reference to the company. Uh, and again, I put up uh, showing different uh, uh, posters that were available for uh, asking for the Invalid Corps. Uh, the officers actually had to apply directly to the Provost Marshal General's office, and they also needed a certificate of disability from a surgeon. And in addition to the other requirements for the enlisted, they also have, had to have a recommendation from at least former commanders in the Army. They wanted good men uh, to work here. Uh, there were five boards uh, created uh, throughout the country uh, to evaluate the, the men who were applying and to assign battalion status to them, so to try to ensure the, the greatest functionality of the Corps. In addition to disabled men, it's interesting that men under 18 and over 45 were eligible for the Invalid Corps, even though they were theoretically not eligible for active duty uh, on the line. Invalid Corps offers, officers were soon on duty in hospitals as company commanders of assigned companies. And this is sort of similar to today's uh, enlisted medical corpsmen. These officers were subordinated to the surgeon in charge of the hospital. And this was very much a first. It was the first time a line officer or a, you know, a general army officer was not a physician, was responsible to a physician. They attended, uh, these officers then would attend to the police duties uh, within the, uh, the unit, the, uh, dis uh, provide the discipline. They also made sure the people had their clothing and arms and the equipment. And they would supervise the payroll to make sure that everybody was getting paid. And interestingly, uh, they were also responsible for providing headboards for the graves of all of the people who were dying in relation to the uh, place they were serving. Uh, this uh, photograph here is a reenactment photograph of a group of uh, 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 Invalid Corps soldiers doing a, a funeral service. 
discipline was established with uniformity, the same as in the infantry. And then each company was uh, to be composed of men from several states. They didn't want uh, everybody from the same hometown the way many of the volunteer uh, line units were. And this, this unit then was to be kept intact once it was established. The detachment served at various locations and were relieved as often as once a week. They uh, may be primarily uh, at the location where the original uh, organized but uh, or assigned the, the hospital particularly, but uh, they would uh, come and go so that nobody was away from their base unit for very long at a time. There were regular and frequent drills uh, held uh, for the units so that they felt like they were in the army. The formation of the units was the same as for the infantry, except there was no maximum number required for the unit to be ordered to active duty. The minimum number uh, required for a unit is extremely nebulous and was never specifically stated. In September 1863, the companies of the Corps were organized into regiments. And at this time, colonels and lieutenant colonels were appointed as of September 15, 1863. Obviously, the air appointment comes at this point because these are regimental officers rather than company officers. A special uniform was created that was really somewhat less than successful. The, uh, the forage cap was a dark blue uh, as the regular army wore and the sky blue trousers as was current in the army at that time, uh, although the regular army would of course worn a, a dark blue uh, coat. The uh, enlisted uh, had a sky blue kersey jacket that was trimmed with dark blue, as we see in this photograph. And it was cut long like the cavalry. It was more than uh, just a sack coat. Uh, officers uh, wore a, also a sky blue frock coat, had collars and cuffs uh, that were dark blue. And the trousers were the sky blue double stripe down the outer seam, uh, as uh, was imagined. And the men did not like being differentiated from comrades in active service. Most of the people in the Corps would have referred to remain in the same uniform as the rest of the Army. Uh, parenthetically, the officer coat was impossible to keep clean and was soon changed to the rest of the Army, even though the sky blue jackets were kept for the enlisted. The field troops jeered at the Invalid Corps. And part of the reason for this was that the principal uh, abbreviation for the Corps, uh, Invalid Corps obviously was IC, but this abbreviation was already in use in the Army, referring to damaged equipment. Uh, it stand, stood for the words inspected and condemned. And the soldiers of the field applied it to the Invalid Corps in a derogatory way. These men did not want to be called invalid in any fashion. And many uh, of the wounded men did not enlist in the Invalid Corps for that very reason. The General Order 111 of March of 64 would change the name of the Invalid Corps to the Veterans Reserve Corps. And this new title uh, was much more acceptable to most of the people and was really a benefit to Esprit de Corps for uh, the entire Veterans Reserve Corps. Surprisingly to me, I've been totally unable to find any recruiting posters uh, with the new label. All the recruiting posters I can find uh, uh, were actually for the Invalid Corps. Now, the service of the Veterans Reserve Corps was a, a variable thing. Many units and detachments of the 1st Battalion of the Corps served as guards and as military police. Many of them uh, would transport uh, prisoners of war, uh, they could, uh, of course, serve as the guards around the hospital, but also uh, in warehousing and uh, basically where needed. Occasionally, they would even be called uh, to, for a combat situation. Um, and uh, actually, this picture here shows a unit at uh, Fort Stevens at the time uh, Washington uh, uh, was threatened uh, by the Confederacy. And uh, this is a group of Invalid Corps soldiers who were uh, also assigned elsewhere temporarily. Uh, 
there's no doubt that the Corps provided a real service to the country. Some total, uh, some 60,000 disabled men served in the Veteran Reserve Corps during the war. At this time, uh, of course, as I said at the beginning, we're more concerned with the more severely disabled men who provided uh, such valuable service to our military hospital. In particular, this is about Company 132, 2nd Battalion, Veterans Reserve Corps in Frederick, Maryland. The 2nd Battalion of the Reserve, Veteran Reserve Corps was used almost exclusively for hospital duty. In December 1864, an order was issued that companies and detachments uh, of the Veteran Reserve Corps might be detached uh, to serve as guards, attendants, nurses, etc., at the hospital, uh, and uh, would be mustered and sent back and forth by the surgeon in charge. They could only be relieved from uh, these duties by the Secretary of War, so the line units no longer had any control over them at all. And finally, uh, it was decided that officially all 2nd Battalion companies should be directly under the command of the Surgeon General. And this would make it similar to the uh, Medical Service Corps that we see today. The duties and roles uh, of these men would then be transported through the Surgeon General to the Adjutant General. The relationship to the line units was completely severed. In December 1, 1863, Company 132, 2nd Battalion, Veterans Reserve Corps was created specifically for duty in hospitals in Frederick. As with many companies, it was very small. It actually contained only 37 men. Now we know that there were two officers uh, assigned at some point, 2nd Lieutenant Frederick Benton and 2nd Lieutenant James Drisdale. Uh, I unable to find photographs of either of these men, and I don't have dates of service when they actually served with the company. Uh, I can't find any other information about Frederick Benton, although he is listed uh, in uh, the Veterans Reserve Corps records as a company commander when the rec company was uh, uh, created uh, initially, so presumably he was the first company commander. James Drisdale uh, had served in the Army uh, previously, we know. He was serving as a uh, private uh, and was wounded at the uh, Battle of Winchester in 1863. He was taken prisoner after that wounding and was sent to Richmond. And uh, then uh, he was subsequently paroled at Camp Parole in Annapolis. Uh, and on parole, he was sent to Armory Square Hospital and uh, in Washington, he was discharged from uh, the Army and Army Square Hospital in June of 1864, and subsequently at his request commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Veterans Reserve Corps. We know that he served in two separate companies, Company 110 and Company 132. We really don't know which came first, uh, but uh, I suspect he went to Company 110 first and then was transferred to 132. This final date of discharge from the service is not stated. Unfortunately, the records that are available often do not have all the dates. They were incomplete like so many other Civil War records. Two sergeants are identified as having served with the 132nd Company. Uh, Edwin Tracy was transferred to the company on January 29, 1864, uh, and as the first sergeant assigned to the company would have served as the uh, company sergeant. Tracy was from New York and had served uh, in the line in the 11th New York Light Artillery. The date he left Company 132 is not known. Uh, presumably, that's when he left the Army. Carlos Huntley, the second sergeant involved, was sent to the uh, company on May 5th of 1864. Huntley uh, was from Connecticut and had served with the 20th Connecticut Infantry uh, and was wounded at the Battle of Chancellorsville in 1863. Uh, he was discharged uh, from the Army in June of 1865 when the general range of discharges uh, 
uh, from the uh, core began. It's interesting that we know that he lived to uh, September 1912, which to me is interesting because this was a disabled man in the first place. Now, it may simply have been wounds that disabled him and not general health. Uh, the next two slides are actually a listing of uh, the 27 men who served as the company. Unfortunately, uh, I have only limited information about these people and subsequent slides will give us more information. There are many of them I don't. As, as uh, John mentioned earlier, the uh, presentation will be uh, online and if anyone is interested, they can go to this and look at the slides uh, to get the complete listing of the soldiers who served. The asterisk here uh, represents uh, the man uh, in the list who served as a sergeant with the company. Uh, and here we see Tracy who also served as a sergeant. I tried to find photographs of the men and unfortunately, once again, a lot of information is missing. Of the 37 men and the two officers who served, I've only been able to find the two photographs. Uh, both of these photos were taken uh, while the men were serving with the line units. They weren't taken while they were with the Invalid Corps. Charles Collins is uh, shown here and uh, Morrill Daly. We'll hear more about about some of this later. Uh, unfortunately, the available hospital records uh, for Frederick, as for most of the hospitals, uh, I gather, uh, do not detail the names of the men working uh, in each specific hospital or give specific duty assignments. So although we may know, we know these people served in Frederick, we don't know which hospital they served at, we don't know what their specific duties, with one exception. Uh, we do know uh, that uh, Barnabas Dunham uh, did serve as a cook at a hospital. He had been wounded at the Battle of Antietam uh, while serving with the 29th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, the records I have do not say specifically what his wound was, uh, but he served as a uh, cook uh, at the hospital in Frederick uh, starting in October of 62. And uh, when he was transferred uh, to the 2nd Battalion in 1864, he continued to serve as a uh, uh, cook with Company 132. Uh, and he served there until uh, five months later, June of 17 of 1864, when he was discharged to return home. I don't have a statement on why he was discharged specifically. It may have been illness and deteriorating health as uh, many of these men did. We do know that he returned to Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, which had been his home, and that he worked uh, in Plymouth uh, at the Plymouth Iron Works. And we also know that he uh, was married in uh, June of 1865 in Massachusetts and that the couple had two children. The interesting thing for a disabled man discharged early and eligible for the Corps he died in 1905 at age 71. Uh, only a few items are known about those who left the Corps uh, before the end of the war. There were 14 men who were discharged prior to Lee's surrender in April 65. Early discharge was usually for increased disability. Uh, mo usually this is not specifically stated. It's interesting, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but one man was transferred back to a line unit. Uh, most of them were discharged. The date and place of death is known for some of the men, and I will detail that where I know it. Several men were classified, several men classified as severely disabled so that they were in the Corps, in the, not only in the Corps, in the 2nd Battalion, lived into the 1890s and beyond. Uh, Abraham Baker uh, is known to have moved to Michigan after the war and applied for a pension. Unfortunately, I don't know whether he received it. Baker died in February 1895. Uh, unfortunately, again, I don't know the date of the end of service. I'm sorry if I keep saying I don't know, but the information is just not available. Uh, other discharges, John Peterson, uh, we know was mustered out of the 132nd Company on June 27 of 1864 and into the 
this is uh, into a line unit, the 16th Massachusetts Infantry, Massachusetts Unattached Infantry. This happened in August of 64 as a corporal. He's the only one of the group known to rejoin the active army. Uh, it's also interesting that uh, although he rejoined the active army, he was discharged from the army itself uh, only uh, five months, uh, three months later uh, in uh, November of 1864. In 1889, uh, Peterson was known to still be alive and living in Hartford, Missouri. I don't know what his age is because his record doesn't state age at enlistment. Bayless Smith, uh, who was mustered out in June of 1864, lived in Rockland, Massachusetts until his death in 1891. Again, I don't know his age. Barnabas Dunham, as we stated earlier, was discharged in 1864. James McGrath was discharged in October of 1864 uh, and he was discharged actually at Harper's Ferry where some of these uh, Frederick people would have served uh, as a, in the detachment there. Uh, remember they could serve uh, on detached duty for part of the time as well. Now we know he had been taken prisoner at White Oak Swamp in 1862, but the details of his parole uh, have not been described. Uh, the rest of the men who were discharged in 1864 are listed here. Most of them I have very little information on. It's interesting that George Smith, who was mustered uh, uh, out of uh, the uh, Veterans Reserve Corps in March of 1864, only three months after having joined the Corps. Uh, John Leonard was uh, discharged in June of 64 while Charles Davis and John Main were discharged in July. Edwin Sparks uh, was discharged in September of 64, while Franklin Leveron and Ezra Nett uh, were discharged in 64, not uh, from Harper's Ferry again. Sylvester Richard was discharged in September of 64. Uh, so what about the other men? What do we know about uh, the remaining men at all, those who uh, were still in the army after uh, uh, the 1st of uh, January 65. James Scrivens was actually mustered out in April of 1865 before the war actually ended. And we know that he was still alive in 1889 in Hartford, Missouri. Again, I don't have an age at uh, enlistment for him, so I don't know what the age was at that time. Williams Briggs, was mustered out in June of 65 uh, after uh, the war was all over. And we know that he lived in Marshfield, Massachusetts until his death in 1895. Uh, the remaining men uh, were all mustered out between July 5th, 1865 and December 1865. But I don't have the, the fate of uh, these people. The entire Veterans Reserve car was officially disbanded in 1866. Although survival time is not known for most of the men in the company, seven men are known to have lived at least 32 years after the war. John Peterson, as we stated, was alive at last contact in 1889, and we know that he was 50 at that time. James Scrivener in 1889 uh, died although we don't know his age. Charles Collins died in, whose photograph we showed, died in 1891 at age 50. Uh, he actually, as we said, he'd been working and uh, did fairly well until suddenly he died. Uh, Abraham Baker was age 43 at his initial enlistment. Uh, served in the Veterans Reserve Corps, as we said, and died in 1895 at age 75. Williams Briggs was actually even older at enlistment. He was 44, and he died the same year at age 76. Barnabas Dunham, who we talked about earlier, died in 1905 at age 71. Charles Huntley is known to have died in 1912, but I don't know his age because, again, we don't have age in enlistment. In conclusion, the Veterans Reserve Corps gave partially disabled men the opportunity to serve 
with the army uh, and uh, feel that they were useful people. 60,000 men uh, were able to return to active service uh, in a limited way because of this, allowing 60,000 able-bodied men to return to uh, combat duty with line units, uh, making it uh, a, a real boon for the Army. The second battalion of the Veterans Reserve Corps provided many men who gave valuable service in hospitals throughout the country and were the first active duty soldiers specifically assigned to hospital duty. As a major hospital site, Frederick, Maryland was selected as the home for one of the many companies of this group. This presentation provides some information about the men of Company 132 of the 2nd Battalion of the Veterans Reserve Corps. If anybody comes across any information uh, on any of these men or uh, more general information about the uh, uh, the uh, second battalion companies, I would uh, love to uh, hear about it. Uh, that's all I have. I'm sorry I had to say I don't know for so much of the time. It's just the fate of medical records. Uh, that's it for me, John. Oh, well, thank you so much for that, Bob. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and, and drop them in the comments there. I'm uh, keeping an eye uh, on them. And interestingly, uh, Bob, to your earlier um, request, if anyone has any information, uh, someone here, uh, Brett, uh, I'm going to destroy his last name, so I'm not going to try something like Sch Schweinfurth, which uh, certainly yeah. is incorrect. Uh, but Brett uh, says he has a picture of Private James Kuhn, 132nd Veteran Reserve Corps in the Veteran Reserve Corps uniform. Oh, I would love to have that picture if he could send, if he could send me them, you could uh, give him my uh, email address. And even, even if he doesn't want to part with the picture, uh, he, if he could communicate the information, I would love it. Sure. Yeah. So, so Brett, if you're, if you're watching, um, get in touch with me, my email, best way is with, via email. Uh, and Brett comments again, I have close to 600 original items relating to the Invalid Corps slash Veteran Reserve Corps. So sounds like uh, he's <laughs> the one who should have given the presentation. <laughs> so, yeah, Brett, I, I think we probably spoke. I think that's the same Brett I spoke to on the phone this morning. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch uh, okay. with him on that and we'll see if we can uh, Very good. Uh, connect you all. Um, let me see here. Uh, Robert Smith asks, uh, do we know if there were ever any members of the USCT eventually assigned to a Veteran Reserve, Reserve Corps company? I do not know. I, actually, I, I, in the information that I came across, I did not find it mentioned specifically. Mm -hmm. yeah, my guess would be no, but yeah, again, not, not yeah, totally that, sure. That would be my guess too. Uh, uh, remember, of course, that there was two years less time for them to, to be wounded and, and join it. And they may not have, uh, may have felt they could be rehabilitated before that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, had, I have not seen anything. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question actually, as you're presenting, yeah. you mentioned, uh, you know, finding these various records and things. For people that are curious out there, where did you find, you know, what were your, your sources for some of this? Where did you find this information? Uh, Basically, it's a matter of uh, going online and just coming up with any terms you could think about and, and clicking and hitting hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of line item, of items on uh, the internet, the uh, state veteran reserve card. There, there is some federal information. There is a list of uh, the uh, regiments within the veteran reserve car, but it has limited information in it. Uh, and uh, you know some of them, uh, it's it's just catch as catch can. Gotcha. I don't know of any uh, book that really details the history of it. Okay, that that was going to be another question I, I had for you. Um, if if you had any book recommendations for to point people, I, I do not. Uh, do you have any sense for what the what the process was like? So obviously the hundred thirty second. Um, was located in Frederick, but w was it something that like a hospital could go to the Surgeon General and request 
um, to have a unit brought to them or how well, did that all work? Remember, we, we said there were 131 units all together uh, and uh, each, so that each state had a certain number of units allocated to it. And uh, I, I think that it uh, depended more on the numbers with uh, in the uh, in the area that you know wherever they were when they were ready to uh, to get out of the army or to uh, uh, wherever they wanted to stay with the corps. Uh, if they had to apply for the the corps, they would of course be asked. But officers or men, they had to apply. They had to get their certificate, and then uh, be uh, joined. And then the state would assign them, depending on how many were uh, in uh, the second battalion, uh, they would then sort them out and uh, move them. Uh, and I think it was just a matter of the uh, army deciding uh, where they needed, where, where the, they had the hospitals where they would have enough people to put together a company that, that made sense to try to run it. It would only have, it would have been the major probably all of the major hospital sites had at least one company. Sure, and, and that makes sense. So uh, basically, as they were available, they would be distributed. Yeah. And in, obviously, they went in and out. I had 130. I had 37 men listed as serving with the uh, the company. Uh, many of these uh, were discharged uh, long before the war was over. So you know, some came in later, some earlier. So it wasn't all uh, or nothing at all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you were drawing from these, if I'm not mistaken, but Brian Racy asks, uh, did the Veteran Reserve Corps have muster records like uh, line item, uh, line, uh, front line regiments? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the information I found on each of the, uh, the 37 men uh, actually uh, had the, the listing actually said which line unit each man came from. Oh, okay. Very interesting. So I have that information. I didn't put it in because of space and, and trying to just reiterate it uh, didn't seem rational to me at the time. The information is available if any, any of those men, if anybody wants it. Got it. Um, Oh, shoot. I had another question. And of course, I can't think of what it was. I mean, um, um, of course, I can't seem to think of it. Um, excellent. Uh, not seeing any other uh, questions there in the comments. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, for uh, your time uh, today and, and for joining us uh, on this, uh, this Thursday. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, racking my brain finally to, to come up with it. Um, Karen Stone uh, commented, um, let's see, uh, where are those records? Uh, I can't find Company H 3rd Regiment. Uh, I guess Karen is uh, uh, trying to do uh, some, some research uh, on her own. Did you find them online? Are we talking the National yeah. Archives? Yeah, on online is... Now, you know, the, uh, some states have within their listing of those who serve talk about the Veteran Reserve Corps, other states don't. So uh, there, there are big gaps when you, when you go online listing, even if you find some uh, a reference that says they have the Corps, they may only have a certain number. Some of them only are going to talk about uh, the uh, uh, the first uh, battalion. And if it's a specific company uh, with a letter designation, it probably uh, is a company within uh, the uh, first battalion. Got it. And I, I finally remembered that other question. Yeah. Uh, we, we've gotten questions on other videos um, at times, you know, asking about, uh, you know, were there any notable or well-known male nurses. There's a lot of press given to uh, female nurses throughout the Civil War, as of course there ought to be. Um, but I, I'm, I would imagine that, you know, male nurses were probably some combination of hospital stewards or veteran reserve corps folks. Uh, is that 
accurate. Uh, uh, wouldn't, have been, wouldn't have been hospital stewards. Uh, they were more up, uh, you know, but uh, the uh, uh, remember that at the beginning of the war, all of the nursing personnel in the hospitals were men. So uh, it wasn't until during the war that women started coming in in an official way. Uh, the uh, uh, I, you know, I found a lot written about nurses. Uh, a lot about the women. I don't find anybody mentioning specific uh, names. And actually, when you go online trying to to find names of women who served as nurses, there's a limited number of, of names that you find. Now we know that uh, the uh, when they did the pension records in 1890 uh, to decide who was eligible for pensions, there were some 22,000 women who uh, were said to have served uh, their requirements. Uh, but uh, there's no way anybody can find 22,000 names of 22,000 women. So I don't know, uh, uh, you know, and, and we know that, the, that probably there were three men for, e at least three men for every one woman who worked as a nurse in a hospital. So there were thousands of, of men who worked, but uh, I don't know of it, you know, uh, Walt Whitman is often quoted as being as been as a nurse. Uh, he, uh, he sort of moved around as he chose as a nurse or companion, as a companion, as, as a visitor, whatever he felt like doing at the time. And I don't believe that he was ever officially enlisted as a nurse. Hmm. You know, the definition of what's a nurse is a variable thing too. According, according to the to the army, it was somebody who uh, had been officially appointed to an army, to a uh, federal position uh, uh, and served at least three months uh, and was paid for by the federal government. Uh, all of these people who worked for the, uh, the various volunteer groups, or if they worked less than three months, were not considered uh, eligible for pensions, et cetera. So they're, they're in addition to this 22,000 I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that, that's the information is just not available. Yeah, that, that's a great point too about what exactly a nurse was is itself kind of a fluid, um, fluid thing. It's uh, becoming more fluid today too. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, uh, another question that uh, we actually spoke to, or you spoke to during the presentation, Martha uh, Jewett, uh, writes in, was the Invalid Corps called up uh, to help fight Jubal Early's troops at the Battle of Fort Stevens? I believe the answer is yes. Yes, yes. Actually, the, uh, there's an anecdote about uh, the uh, unit, uh, the, the group who were serving at Fort Stevens. Uh, supposedly, the general in uh, command of the defense asked the colonel in charge of the unit if uh, his men would stand. And he said, we can't run. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, but, but yes, they were important in the defense of Washington at Fort Stevens. Well, splendid. Uh, that uh, brings us uh, pretty much to the end of uh, questions here. And uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour. So again, thank you, Bob, for joining us today. Thank, thank, thank you for thank allowing me to give this. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you all out there for watching. Uh, give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Um, and um, share it, uh, share it uh, on your Facebook page, tell your friends about it, send it to them. Uh, and if you really enjoyed the video, uh, consider becoming a member. It goes directly to supporting great content like this. And we deeply appreciate the generosity of uh, so many uh, who, who have done that. So thank you all for tuning in. And this is uh, Bob and myself uh, signing off.